Our next session, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is where we will be unveiling the technology behind India's largest UPI payment service provider, PSP, powered by the groundbreaking Unified Payments Interface, UPI, technology. This platform enables seamless, real-time transactions across banks. Its user-friendly mobile app ensures secure fund transfers supported by advanced encryption. With AI-driven insights, personalized recommendations, and fraud detection, this technology is reshaping India's financial landscape, driving convenience and inclusion. Next up is the product showcase on technology behind India's largest UPI, PSP. And our esteemed speakers for this session are Ishan Sharma, who is the Vice President, Business Development, Just Pay. Can I have Ishan on stage, please? Joining Ishan is uh, Arun Ram Prasad, who is the Head, UPI Product, Just Pay. Thank you, Ishan and Arun. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, introduced, I'm Ishan. He's Arun. We're both from Just Pay. So, I think uh, we'll start the session with, uh, you know, giving you an introduction about what does JustPay do in UPI ecosystem and then deep dive into how do we run uh, UPI uh, and uh, what is our approach towards uh, UPI in-house and how, what the challenges which we have faced and how have we gone about and solved some of those challenges. So, uh, as uh, you know, the slide iterates that we have been deeply invested in UPI ecosystem since 2016. Our, so to say, the first twist with the uh, UPIs happened when, uh, you know, we designed the UPI common library. This is something that you do use in and in day out when you're uh, doing a UPI transaction. And uh, it's a place where you enter your PIN, your uh, credentials and the transaction uh, happens, right? Because of this, this common library was designed and built by us for NPCI. This was our first interaction with UPI. And then eventually, uh, you know, we got the opportunity to build Beam uh, as well. The first version of Beam, which was launched, was built by JustPay. And that really got us into thinking that, okay, UPI can actually be a game changer. And we started doubling down on efforts and invested a lot into building this out, right? And now, to this day, we power some of the largest merchants on UPI which includes uh, whether it's Amazon, Swiggy, uh, uh, Cred, etc. Any, any consumer app that you use on your phone, if you're using UPI, the probability is that they are using just pay behind the scenes for powering UPI payments. And similarly, uh, largest consumer apps, whether it's Google Pay or, uh, you know, others, uh, they also use uh, just pay. And the unique thing that we did after this was that after a point we had to move to cloud as well. So we were the first which actually moved a UPI PSP, which was traditionally in a bank environment, right? A bank on-premise environment. What we took the giant leap of moving it to a cloud uh, because scalability, et cetera, was becoming a challenge. Hence, we moved to the cloud. And now we run not in just one cloud, multiple clouds. And now recently, uh, we launched the plugin SDK, which can actually help any merchant app do the transactions inside the merchant app only without relying on a third-party app. That's the latest thing that we have uh, come up with, and it was launched yesterday. Uh, on the scale that we do, right, uh, so as we power some of the largest TPAPs and the merchants, the, the responsibility is on us to deliver what the scale they want, right? So whether it's uh, Google Pay, Amazon Pay, they have expectations of us fulfilling any scale, whether it's a sale that comes in or an event that comes in. So we have battle-tested it for very high uh, TPS, uh, right now also we do around 60 million transactions per day, both on issuing and acquiring availability. Uh, and these are some of the statistics that, you know, that we as a responsible company have to abide by in order to, uh, you know, support the largest cons uh, companies that we do. Uh, I'll just introduce, uh, I know some of you might be aware, but just give you a snapshot into what is the four-party model of a UPA transaction, right? And what are the unique things about this model? So if you see, right, uh, when a customer is doing a, either a P2P transaction, that is transferring money to a customer, or doing a 
P2M transaction, which is he's transacting on a merchant. These are the core players involved in that transaction. So for example, uh, let's take an example of you uh, buying anything on, say, make my trip, right? You are buying a ticket and you want to buy it by UPI. Now, once you initiate a transaction, when you go to make my trip, the typical mode that we all use is intent these days, right? Where you get all these apps are listed and you click on that and transaction happens. So once you click on any app, then the app gives a control to the PSP. That is the handle that you have created on the app. So if it is say, okay, I say, say, then it goes to NPCI and henceforth, right? So as you're seeing, there are different, for every transaction, there are different parties that are involved. And this, although introduces a lot of flexibility in terms of how, you know, different players can come in and innovate together, but this also introduces complexity as every, you know, the chain is as strong as the weakest link, right? So, uh, you know, all parties have to innovate together and there are some critical components that have to be solved in for uh, a UPA transactions to be stay, uh, successful. Uh, if we break UPA PSP into components, right? Uh, we are in this session. We have tried to break UPA into different components in order for you to understand that although it appears like a monolithic switch, where you know if there is a bank PSP, but inside that monolithic switch, there are multiple components that are uh, giving uh, different functionalities, right? So you pay consumer stack typically is the issuing side of thing, things, right? So if you have a parlance with the card world would be that a card issuing switch like a Pfizer or someone, right? Here UPI plays that role, uh, that UPI switch plays the role of that. Then you have UPI merchant stack that is for acquiring a transaction. This is equivalent to a payment gateway that you use for a card, say a cyber source or an MPGS. This is also sitting in that UPI switch. Then you have the UPI issuer bank where all the settlement of funds and your PIN, uh, whether your PIN is correct or not, whether funds are there or not, those gets handled. And then you have interfaces, UPA, SDK. And now with uh, Rupay getting in, there is another component that is getting added to the UPI, PSP, which is about Rupay uh, issuance as well. And then finally, recon and settlements, because UPI switch is also connected to bank systems. And then UPI switch is also connected with NPCI. So there is a lot of data exchange that happens. And then finally, when money exchange also has to happen, there are a bunch of files that are transferred and that is the responsibility of UPI switch to ensure that the data is correct and finally bank post the money. This is how you recon on that uh, data. Uh, now uh, Arun will deep dive into you know, some of the tech aspects of how you know, we uh, see scale and how we handle some of these things. Yeah, thanks Ishan. So I think while in Ishan introduced how just based numbers, right, let's say we currently process 55 to 70 million transactions a day across multiple stacks. Uh, the journey was mired with a lot of challenges. And the challenges, maybe I'm just going to talk from Jaspi's reference and my reference. Uh, this was back in 2019, right, uh, where UPA was start having this knee-jerk reaction in terms of transactions. All UPA apps were racing against each other for market share and then tremendously growing. Started with zero in 2016, hit two billion around early 2019. 3, 4 billion from the end of 2019, now it is at 10 billion. So when a system was scaling this, or a UPA was scaling this fast, the systems that are powering UPA transactions inside banks, these are traditionally on-prem systems, uh, they were, I think, not ready for this kind of a scale. While people provision for like, let's say one or two, three X traffic, this was like tremendously increasing day on day, month on month, 100% growth kind of a thing, right? I think systems are not uh, scaled up for that thing. So suddenly uh, a sprout of transactions starts coming in. So that's when when scale start increasing, we start facing reliability challenges. So when more transaction comes in, your systems tend to go down. And you will, and you, you can rate limit a transaction, but that's going to end up having a poor customer experience. So that's the first challenge. When st scale start increasing, uh, systems start, system reliability start going down. Okay, so we solve for scale. So we can start adding more machines, more servers. But the cost start increasing. And we all know, right, I think UPA has low economics. Uh, when you have low economics, you have to f figure out a way to, like, let's say, sustain uh, the business model where you, you cannot afford to have unlimited systems, unlimited resources. That's the second challenge. How can you solve for cost at the same time uh, provide seamlessly scalable systems? The third thing, um, I think 
one of the key principles of reliability is that do as much few changes as possible to a system so that the system is always reliable. I think you can take example of an aviation system or any of the other reliable systems. They don't undergo a lot of changes that fast. But UPI, you can see, I think, literally, I think we can say every circular a week or a month keeps coming in and I'll be a governor in MPC meetings and all, two, three announcements on UPI. So that's what you will see on UPI, right? You, it's tremendously changing faster and faster. Systems are changing faster and especially the four-party model, right? Everybody has to change faster. And any of the one system fails in the four-party model, your transaction is a failure. So that's where every, the systems involved in this entire UPI ecosystem has to continuously change. And somebody who's powering these all four-party model, uh, systems in all four-party model has to change continuously. But you have to give reliable systems. You have to achieve the optimum of 99.99 and 100% uptime. I think these are some of the challenges that we faced. In fact, how do you figure out the right trade-off between these conflicting needs, right? Reliability, scale, agility, cost. Yeah. So I think I'm just going to talk about some of the things that JustPay did and how uh, we tried to figure out the strike the right balance between these three, these four conflicting needs. Yeah. So when I talk about reliability, I think I think this is these are the four core principles of JustPay. I think anybody coming into JustPay, I think we imbibe these principles in the people who join JustPay. So it's about reliability, zero downtime systems. And we don't even call 99.99, right? I think while well, we have represented 99.99, the idea is to like, let's say your system should never go down, 100% uptime. Second is scalability. Your system should horizontally scale. I think you should not worry about, let's say, adding systems. Somebody should come and add systems. No, you should automatically scale as per need. I think that's the second principle that we work on. Third is agility. When I talk about agility, it, it's in two, uh, two aspects. One is you should be making faster developments and especially a startup like JustPay, right? I think even while we are still 1,000, uh, we still have this, we still think of ourselves as a very early stage startup and then run faster. So you have to build faster. That's the first requirement in respect to agility. Second, I'm, I'm going to talk about processing speed, performance. How fast you process a, a transaction, right? I think you, when you are powering UPI transactions, which is happening like less than five seconds or 20 seconds, depending on the payment mode, you cannot, and there are four or five systems involved, you cannot afford to have time to uh, process the transaction and customers waiting on your app. I think that's where processing time uh, becomes a key need for us. That's again, I'm gonna add it to agility. And fourth is visibility. You should have visibility into what is happening in your system, whether it's a systems, application, what is happening in your system, and how can you like, let's say, uh, have oversight into the transactions and prevent any downside, uh, downtimes, right? That's the fourth pillar which we call visibility. Uh, moving on. So one of the things I think JustPay did differently is that we are the early adopters of Haskell, which is a functional programming language, uh, which gives the performance like C, which is closer to the machines where you can po um, perform a transaction much faster or like talk to the machines much faster, but it gives, the main advantage it gives was, it gives a readability closer to English. As a result, let's say when I write a, when I write a PRD in a, in a Word doc, I can literally translate, just not, not very literally, but I can just translate that uh, logic I have written in a Word doc to code easily. I think that's where we were able to like achieve super fast development speeds. While a product manager can just go and read what has developer written. <laughs> this is what you can see as a module which process send money transaction, which is sending to a person in your UPA volunteer. This is this concise, you can write a code. I think that's what, that gave us a lot of leverage in terms of uh, development cycle, optimizing our development cycle. Second, oh, sorry. Second, Haskell gave us another advantage, which was immutability. Let's say your functions, this is all functional programming languages, and you can define, let's say this function output is gonna be like only this. It will not accept any other uh, form of results that comes into this thing. As a result, what you are able to achieve was lesser bugs in your code. So lesser bugs, you can write close to English. I think that helps you to like develop your uh, application much faster. I think that's what Haskell gave us. As a result, what we were able to achieve was zero technical declines. Because you can preempt all your failures of, uh, to the left. While, while a developer is writing a code, 
you don't need a much much develop much testers to test your code because haskell itself does that for you second a product manager can just verify your business logic at the time of development itself or close to development i think that's where we are able to like let's say shift left and move closer to zero technical declines second like i said haskell gives performance like c which is much much closer to the machine and that's where i think we were able to achieve less than 100 millisecond transaction latency which is performance this helped us in another way maybe i'll just going to touch upon that subsequently uh yeah on agile so while we were able to develop things faster one of the key needs was that you can develop but how fast are you able to like release this uh, application or the logic to production i think that's a big challenge right because whatever you do you can keep developing but you have to like move it to production and then see how it uh, works right i think that's where we had we have built inbuilt machines uh, which is which does your releases in an automated fashion with less manual effort it not just does releases right it what it does is we have three components and this one is a automated regression tester uh, second is an autopilot machine and third is a ab testing machine so what these three components uh, gave us right art automated regression testing machine what we were able to do is that we were able to like record our production traffic so we have been already running in production right we were able to record our production traffic and replay it on our uat and check when i am doing a new develop new new application release right i can de deploy it in uat i can record my production traffic and deploy it in my uat and see whether my request response db state everything is matching with what it happens in production as a result we were able to like let's say reduce our testing efforts we can just move to an automated testing suite otherwise you will how will run 65000 at 1 lakh test cases and the moment you run all those things right your development cycle keeps going up i think art gave us that kind of oh sorry so art gave us art gave us that kind of uh, advantage where we were able to like um, do our development cycle much faster uh, autopilot releases things much faster and you are able to like stagger your release 1 2 3% uh, and then keep doing stagger releases ab testing framework when you are releasing you can test whether my previous system and this system is working working uh, in tandem and there is no bugs second is uh, third is scalability sorry one minute can i have five minutes additional or is it? sorry i think i am running out of time sorry sure i'll just run two minutes extra yeah sure so second thing that we were able to achieve was this when it comes to scalability right uh, what we did was we moved to cloud from on prem we moved to cloud cloud gave us uh, leverage to uh, leverage to like let's say seamlessly scale my application layer but the problem came in i was able to seamlessly scale my application layer but my problem come in database layer well database is a one single point of failure you cannot scale it as as and when you need and that's when uh, it is an al al it also incurs a lot of cost at one of the most uh, important important cost component in your system is your application layer and uh, database layer so database is the most costless thing in europe so what we did was we moved from applic we moved we, we moved the we moved Uh, we introduce a new layer about database layer which is uh, redis or a cache layer what we do is that we seamlessly scale up application a cache layer which is in a cluster model you can have multi any number of machines in the cache you try to cache and serve your real time transactions from your cache and slowly drain this cache into database so that you don't you not have a big database machine you can have a lighter database machine which is most which is the most costly component in your system and have the scalable cache layer and serve your real time traffic from the cache layer we were able to achieve cost efficiency here we were able to achieve any number of scale here so just go directly to hyper sdk yeah yeah sure so just this slide yeah so under uh, one of the key one of the new, one of the other uh, innovation that we have done is uh, we have a new we have a platform sdk platform called hyper sdk what we were able to do was we were able to like Uh, we did, we did, we wrote our own framework for hyper sdk where we can how you run a microservices architecture similarly you can have a sdk micro app based architecture and where when just space powering multiple products what it does is that one complex platform powering multiple smaller product features maybe it upi be it any other just pay products they, they they can seamlessly fit into one platform of just pay and what capabilities that it has was over the air pushes when you want to release something you don't need to go uh, and do a new app release this is able to like 
push release, uh, push your upgrades faster over there. So that like whenever the customer downloads the next, customer comes on your app next time, it automatically downloads and upgrades your app. So these are some of the capabilities that we're able to build and sophisticated, sophisticated monitoring on top of, uh, monitoring and visibility on top of our SDK, which are able, as a result, we were able to like reduce failures and do seamless releases faster on our uh, UPI apps as well. And now we have launched uh, Hyper UPI, which is again built on the same platform, which is uh, our Hyper SDK platform. What it enables you is to like, as a merchant, you can just take this UPI Hyper SDK and power seamless one-click UPI ex experience without doing app switch to any of the existing UPI apps. Uh, this is powered by a bank app in the background, but ne customer may not download this app and have a one seamless, uh, and merchants, customers can have a seamless one-click experience on any merchant app. And this improves your um, merchant payment success rates by 10% because it reduces number of clicks as a, as a result of user dropouts. It reduces the number of systems in the four-party model to actually two systems or three. As from seven, it reduces the number of systems to three systems. As a result, you avoid failure points in a transaction, again, reducing your technical declines to near zero. I took a lot of time. Thanks. No, we have another five minutes. So, if you want. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, hi. My name is Mohit. Uh, I'm from Make My Trip, right? My question is around the Haskell use mentioned, right? And Ishan, you mentioned you know, multiple modules across consumer lending, uh, this rupee credit card. Is it being used across? all the modules, what is the current scale it's processing and is it deployed across modules or is it used for one particular module as of now? So Haskell, I think we are powering all our UPI stacks on Haskell. If I can take names, uh, some of the largest UPI apps like Google Pay, Amazon Pay, Cred, uh, merchants like Dream11, Swiggy, all of them are powered through our stack and all these UPI stacks are written on Haskell. The 55 million transactions or 70 million transactions that we saw it's all, it's entirely Haskell. It has, it is processing 5,000 TPS currently as we speak, and it's seamlessly scalable up to 50,000 TPS. And another advantage which I missed mentioning about in the last thing is that Haskell gave us performance uh, improvements where one core of my uh, machine, uh, uh, CPU, was processing four or five TPS of transactions for us. When we moved to Haskell, we were able to go to 50. That's a 10x improvement in terms of uh, performance which reduces our cost by 10x. That's, that's the advantage Haskell gave us. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, continuing on the Haskell part, um, number one, I think kudos to all you guys uh, for making it a poster child for Haskell. Uh, yeah. But uh, the flip side is that, you know, it's a little bit of a niche, right, in terms of a skill set. Uh, how do you manage the training and uh, talent hunting part of it? Thank you. Uh, it's a great way to hire. Uh, <clears throat> so, you're absolutely right. I don't think any college in India teaches Haskell. Uh, but our belief, like what Arun was saying was, we don't want programming to be a barrier between creativity, right? And, uh, you know, sorry for all the developers. I'm a developer myself. I did B.Tech engineering. I did computer science engineering, masters in computer science engineering. But I think uh, the way systems are right now, developers are treated as God. And we believe anyone who creates is God. It's not just developers, right? To break that barrier is where we took an approach where we chose a language where after the initial learning curve, right, the productivity is uh, immense. So you're getting a Swiss Army knife kind of thing. You saw the code, right? It's like English. So Haskell is a functional programming. Functional programming is at, is at the same level as category theory, and category theory is the basis of all math. Uh, right? So you can write code like equations. Uh, so how do we crack that? Um, we only hire from tier 2, tier 3 colleges. Uh, we have a very, very wide uh, campus hiring uh, approach. We've scaled that out also. We can have a talk on how we scaled out hiring. Um, we look for problem solving. That's it. Uh, simple. Of course, there's a good culture fit around. A space hiring is typically two days long. They do hackathons and all of that. Once people have problem solving and they have the passion, curiosity, uh, we look for systems thinking, people who are always looking for depth in some way, whether they've been a cricketer, whether they've been a dancer for nine years, or whether they've been painting for uh, ten years, whatever, right? Somewhere they're looking for depth. When you have these together, 
picking anything is not a challenge at all, whether it's Haskell, whether it's Go or whatever. So kids come in, uh, mostly everyone's uh, freshers um, in JustPay and then uh, they go through a two, three month boot camp, they learn uh, Haskell. So we, have, we work very deeply with the Haskell Foundation itself. Uh, we contribute a lot to the Haskell Foundation. The founders are sometimes involved in our journey. Haskell, the person who wrote Haskell, uh, has given a few talks. And uh, that's how we've been able to scale to, you know, 800, 900 um, engineers who all understand Haskell and just pay. Sure. I think there's one more. Can do we have? Sorry. Yeah, Merchant SDK plugin was released yesterday. Yeah, it's in TypeScript. It's also functional, statically done, but since it's front end, Haskell doesn't, you know, run on phone, so um, it gives us the power of having dynamic code with JavaScript, so TypeScript compiles to JavaScript, yeah. 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 So I'll just repeat the question for the advantage of others. Uh, what's stored in the cache layer? Is it just the VPA to uh, address res uh, bank address resolution, right? In the cache layer between the database and uh, settlement recon, how does that happen? Um, correct? So the cache layer, sorry? No, settlement recon, everything is that part of your uh, real time Is that something itself? which we do? Yes. Yeah, I'll answer the second part first, yes. We facilitate full, uh, so we provide the entire tech for running a UPI acquiring and issuing to a bank, right? So settlement recon is also fully facilitated, uh, facilitated by us. All the tech and automation is given. Of course, the bank has its own controls in terms of makers, checkers, and integrating into their thing. So the short answer is yes, we uh, provide that. The first one, um, again, a short answer is what goes in the cache is effectively everything which goes inside the database. It's not just uh, the resolution between a VPA to everything. We don't hit, we don't touch the database during a UPI transaction because the database is your biggest bottleneck. Even the biggest database, if we deploy it on AWS or on uh, GCP, will not scale to 20, 30,000 TPS. If it's a relational database like a MySQL or something, right, they get prohibitively expensive. Bankers here would know that, you know, the, you know, every time you have to scale up Oracle, that's when you really have to bring out the checkbook. Um, but here, uh, Redis is horizontally scalable. We don't hit the database in real time at all during the transaction. So we treat the KV layer almost like a database. We write the SQL in and out queries and we do the uh, querying there. So while UPI is simplistic at some level, I don't want to oversimplify that, it's just the VPA to thing. It's everything, your session tokens, your transaction history, your tracking of the transaction at that time, everything goes into the uh, Redis cache. And that's the only reason he can sit here, and he can stand here and claim that we can scale to 50,000 TPS because we can scale to 50,000 TPS on this uh, because Redis is horizontally scalable, unlike a database. There's a lot more. We can discuss outside. It's a lot more than uh, VPA to bank. It does contain that, but it's a lot more than that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Ishan, Arun, and the gentleman.